I, now I'm going to turn it over to Professor Antal Yavitsky, who's from the physics department. It's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Frank Wilczek. Frank is a Hermann Feschbach professor at MIT. In 2004, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for physics for the discovery, together with Gross and Pollitzer, for the discovery of asymptotic freedom in the theory of strong interactions. Um, we should, in connection with that work, we should say that um, even though the title says it that way, but there was no theory of strong interactions <laughs> before, before the work of Wilczek, Gross, and Pollitzer. There were very uh, ideas which, which, which vastly disagreed, but as soon as that work appeared, we had QCD established as a theory of strong interactions. So our physics of the standard model and or the looking back at the 20th century particle physics would look very different had the result turned out to be to turn, turned out to, to be different. Frank was an undergrad in, in math and he got his PhD in 74 at, at Princeton. In fact, the Nobel Prize winning work was, was a, a, the PhD, PhD work. I remember since uh, I was a grad student at that same time when that paper appeared, indeed almost everyone had the paper on their desk, but even more so everyone or many people who were capable of checking the calculations were very eager to do so. It made a big difference whether the result was positive or negative, in this case meaning the sign of the beta function which they, they have, have calculated, and um, the negative sign which they established meant that QCD indeed is a theory of strong interactions. Um, Frank um, was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study. He went on also to the University of California. Um, after this work, he contributed greatly to QCD, that theory which, which he helped establish. Uh, he made predictions which are very novel, something called color superconductivity is, is one of the phases that was predicted. He, he made novel <laughs> suggestions for particles, new, new particles, and their relevance in, in both physics and condensed matter physics, um, axions, anions, and one of the very interesting latest ideas, which, which I just read about, is um, a space-time <coughs> cr crystal, where he, he has authored many popular books, I will not list the awards. I think the last one which struck my eye is the King Faisal Award, which I don't think I know many people who got that. <laughs> so with that, I, I would like to offer it to Frank. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Antal. So when Leon Cooper asked me to talk at the 250th anniversary of Brown University about what physics would look like in 250 years, of course I accepted immediately. <laughs> and then I thought about it. <laughs> and uh, thinking about it is quite daunting. I looked for examples in history and the nearest or the most successful perhaps, uh, most impressive uh, example I could find was Newton's queries. Uh, Newton at the end of his career, uh, although he famously uh, spurned hypotheses, he uh, wasn't averse to stating questions. As long as you put a question mark at the end, it's okay. <laughs> so then they're queries, not hypotheses. Anyway, he, uh, he wrote <coughs> these famous uh, queries that predicted very richly and in detail, not always correctly, but in fruitful ways, how physics would evolve. And uh, for a hundred years, those queries looked very good. But after a hundred years, they were starting to show their age. Uh, 
Faraday uh, was, was changing uh, the, to the field theoretic uh, view of the world instead of particles. Uh, chemistry, which Newton uh, had some confused ideas about, was becoming a real a mature subject uh, with Lavoisier. Uh, so uh, 100 years looks more li realistic. So my talk is going to be uh, about a hundred physics in 100 years, <laughs> trying to identify some opportunities and challenges. And these are not meant really seriously to be predictions. Uh, uh, for, fortunately, I realize I won't have to face the music, most likely, <laughs> for this. But it's an opportunity to think about where the field is, what looks ripe, what looks promising, and I hope you'll take it in that spirit. <coughs> so first I want to, I'll, I'll be talking about a, uh, a grab bag, actually a baker's dozen of different uh, topics, uh, seven of which will be about unification which is a grand tradition in physics. And uh, there are aspects of unification that uh, look very ripe. There are also aspects that look really tantalizing. And whether they're ripe or not, we have to uh, come to terms with them. <coughs> so once when I was giving a uh, popular t lecture, afterwards uh, someone asked me in the question session, uh, why do you guys care so much about unification? Isn't it just enough to get things right? And that's actually a pretty profound question if you think about it. Why, <laughs> why do we insist, why do we uh, in physics so much look for unification? Well, I think there are two answers. I didn't have a good answer at the time, but I thought about it. Uh, one is that there are many success stories where people seeking to unify things uh, even when the motivation for unification wasn't pressing for any particular problem, have, uh, uh, when they succeeded, uh, given us tools, given us ideas that went far beyond uh, the initial motivations or the initial uh, horizon of what, what could be seen in, uh, from the subject separately. So I'll get there. I've listed a, a number of examples. Uh, given the amount of time, I won't go into a detailed discussion of these, but they take my word for it. If they're very impressive examples of unification yielding enormous uh, fruit in the development of our understanding of nature. Uh, I'll just mention a couple that are particularly striking. Uh, one is uh, Hamilton's unification of mechanics and ray optics, which is particularly striking because the motivation was really very conceptual. There, were, there was no need, really, to show that mechanics and wave theory, the, the you know, particle theory of particles and the wave of mechanics and the wave theory of light could be seen within a larger framework as two as aspects of a, a unifying uh, concept, but Hamilton thought it would be pretty to do that and did it very successfully, introduced what's called the Hamiltonian and techniques which two centuries later, no, one century later, <laughs> one century later, <laughs> hundred years, uh, turned out to be absolutely fundamental in understanding the world of quantum mechanics, which was worlds away from what he was uh, thinking about. Uh, another one. Uh, Right after that is uh, Maxwell, who uh, took the laws of electricity and magnetism as they were known at that time, uh, put them in an unusual form, uh, escaping from the Newtonian influence, putting them in terms of Faraday's non-mathematical ideas of field theory, or not, or mathematical conceptually, but not in equations. Maxwell uh, put them to equations. And when he, when he did that, he found he had to fix the equations. There were some missing bits, which he supplied. And uh, that brought together not only electricity and magnetism, which he was seeking to unify, but turned out to uh, bring in optics and, uh, and new forms of light 
which have spawned uh, the technology of the 20th and 21st century. And one measure of how far ahead of that unification was of its time is that uh, the, the Maxwell equations in their mature form appeared in 1864, and it was almost 20 years before there was experimental proof from Heinrich Hertz that they actually worked, that the new uh, innovations that Maxwell needed to introduce uh, were actually true in the world. And this is my second answer about why we should seek for unification. Isn't it pretty to think so? Why have two things when you can have one? Or why have six when you can have one? Or four when you can have And uh, we can always try to do better. <coughs> and when we do, it's pretty. So now uh, with that preamble to, to examples, or not example, to, yes, examples, <laughs> to uh, 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 things that uh, are on the horizon today. This is a representation of uh, what's usually called the core, uh, the standard model. I like to call it the, the core theory of, uh, of matter. This summarizes in a simple cartoon uh, basically everything we know with certainty about physics. If you know how to unpack it, uh, we assume the theory of relativity and Einstein's theory, uh, general relativity here. Uh, then there are three other forces that need more spelling out. In relativity, all you need to know is that there's energy and momentum and a metric, and you don't have to give a detailed census of what kinds of particles there are because there's a, a universality to it. Uh, the other forces, we need to specify various quantum numbers. And uh, the, the quantum numbers are usually called colors. In the case of the strong and weak interactions, there are three of them for the strong interactions here, red, green, and blue, two of them for the weak interactions, yellow and purple. And this is a complete accounting of matter. There's also uh, what's called hypercharge, which is basically electric charge. So there are three. Uh, made three forces, weak, strong, electromagnetic, and, a com and this is a complete inventory of the different particles in terms of their properties, and then in terms of their names. But the important point is if you know the properties, you don't need to know the names. Everything follows from the transformation laws among these different kinds of uh, colors. They're, they're not, of course, physical colors. They have they are more like electric charges, but in the strong interaction, there are three of them. In the weak interaction, there are two of them. And we have not only uh, fields that respond to the charges, but also fields that change one into the other. And uh, here I've stripped away some of the excess baggage, uh, gravity. Higgs field is gone, <laughs> and also the uh, threefold repetition of families is gone. Uh, we'll come back to gravity. The rest I'm going to sweep under the rug because <laughs> we because it does. You know, I have to be honest. It doesn't yet appear in a compelling way in the unification, but we will uh, we'll we'll do pretty well to make that scattered pattern into uh, a unified whole. So here's. Here's a metaphor for it. Of course, I won't de review the detailed mathematics. Uh, suppose someone handed you this pattern. Okay. Uh, if you didn't know, if you don't have uh, dodecahedral literacy, <laughs> you wouldn't really know what to make of this pattern. Right? It's, it's scattered stuff, uh, pentagons, some glued together in funny ways. But if you do have dodecahedral literacy, or if you are on to the idea of symmetry and realize that there are only a small number of three-dimensional platonic solids of high symmetry, which points you to a dodecahedron, uh, you might realize that this is clearly meant to be that. But somebody's erased bits and disconnected it. Or you might say that there are external influences that have distorted the pattern. And we can ask ourselves, could that be the case for these scattered interactions 
We had four interactions, weak, strong electromagnetic and gravity, and the scattered entities, the things that have separate existence, not connected by symmetry, and there were six of them. Uh, could it be that those are really are meant to be, that their role in life is to be one bigger symmetry that includes all the transforming interactions among all the colors, not just weak and strong separately, and uh, with those transformations, do all the particles get related to each other? And of course, I wouldn't be taking you down this garden path if the answer were anything but yes. Uh, we can have a unification in what's called the spinner representation of SO10. Again, I won't insist on the mathematical details, but I know there are some computer scientists in the audience. And uh, think of this as a register with uh, <laughs> bits that can be plus or minus, <coughs> and there's a parity check. But other than that, these are all possible states of that uh, five-bit register. Uh, they correspond to positive or negative half units of the different charges. That's the way the group theory looks. The red, green, blue, yellow, the red, green, and blue strong color charges. This is plus, this is minus the half unit, and similarly for the weak charges. And uh, those funny numbers, those funny electric charges, or more accurately uh, hypercharges, which had to be attached uh, phenomenologically to the different kinds of entities, now are related to the strong and weak colors. <coughs> and, well, if I had a little more time, I could spell out for you how you get from that abstract pattern to that weird-looking disconnected pattern of the different assignments of colors and charges that we actually need in reality. So it becomes very plausible that the stuff we've seen actually is meant, is crying out to be put into this more symmetric <coughs> framework. So not only do the symmetry transformations fit, but also the different kinds of matter fit like a glove into this pattern. So instead of having six entities and four forces, uh, we now have one entity and one force, although I've left out gravity. We'll, we'll come back to that. <coughs> but uh, there's a problem with this when you turn from counting just quantum numbers to counting dynamics. Uh, Yang and Mills taught us how, from a symmetry, we can d generate a dynamical theory, and that's the core of the core theory, that idea that you can go from symmetry to dynamics. And uh, their prescription, however, tells us that the strength of all the forces should be the same if they're really manifestations of one common universal underlying force. But in nature, they aren't. Oops. However, one thing we've learned from our study of the uh, core theory, a major lesson which people got Nobel Prizes for, is that uh, we, what you see isn't what you get in a very precise sense. That Empty, what appears to us as empty space is not empty, but has spontaneous activity, which we call virtual particles or quantum fluctuations or zero-point motion, all different names for the same thing. That's, uh, and I'm sorry, this, the, the dynamics here didn't survive translation from keynote to PowerPoint, so this is just a static <laughs> image. But uh, the, uh, all the time, everywhere, you would, if you had uh, eyes that could resolve 10 to the minus 24th seconds and 10 to the minus 14 centimeters, you'd see bubbling activity, fluctuations in energy density. What's pictured here is fluctuations in energy density in gluon fields, where you see the bright colors, the density is high. Where it's uh, less bright, the density is low, and of course it's cut off so you can see something at, a, at, a, at an arbitrary point. Uh, anyway, the lesson of this is that what, when we 
look at the properties of particles or when particles look at each other averaging over long wavelengths, they don't see the basic underlying fundamental aspect of those particles at all. They see through a distorted medium. And we have to correct for those distortions if we want to get a truer view of what the particles themselves look like at short distances. So we're like fish looking at things through a turbulent medium. <coughs> and we can make those corrections and see if, when we do, the promised equality of the different interactions uh, actually occurs. And uh, if you do the calculation, he here's where we know things. And this is on a logarithmic scale, so going from here to here is 16 orders of magnitude. Uh, the LHC took us one order of magnitude. The next super collider might take us one more order of magnitude. <laughs> So we're extrapolating way, way, way beyond uh, uh, what's uh, experimentally justified, but you can do it with the stroke of a pen. Why not? And you see that it almost works. There's uncertainty, experimental and theoretical uncertainties are basically the width of these lines. And if you just take into account the fluctuations we get from all the known fluids, all the known particles, so not only the gluons, but also the W bosons, the Higgs particles, the quarks and antiquarks. Everybody fluctuates. Everybody makes corrections. You add those all in, do the calculation, and uh, it's a near miss. Okay. So if we listen to Karl Popper, we should congratulate ourselves. Uh, he said the goal of science is to produce falsifiable theories. Here's a theory that's not only falsifiable, but even false. <laughs> What, what could be better? <laughs> but of course, that's not our attitude. If we have a beautiful idea that almost works, we try to make it work. And we try to make it more beautiful. Maybe we've missed something. And if you think about our unification, at first it seems, how could you go any further? We've unified all the substances into one. We've unified all the forces into one. But then you realize that's two things, forces and substances, like yin and yang. Uh, in fact, the forces are very much like the con Chinese concept of yang, and this, the stuff that's pushed around is like the, the yin. Uh, and we can ask ourselves whether those could be aspects of one common uh, entity. And that seems outrageous to, phys to physicists who have a little bit of not well, who have a lot of knowledge, but not the key knowledge. <laughs> uh, it was found in the 1970s, however, that it is possible to construct theories, these are called supersymmetric theories, in which force particles, in other words bosons, and substance particles, the fermions, are symmetric with one another. So there are transformations of the equations that change fermion fields into boson fields and boson fields into fermion fields, but leave the content of the equations unchanged. That's what supersymmetry is. And that means if you understand one, the other has to be there to be what you get a, as it transforms. Uh, and the interactions are related. And we can uh, deduce some properties. <coughs> and if we include the effect of supersymmetric particles, and if they're not too heavy, uh, then it works. So we have to make recompute those corrections then it works, and there's more. Gravity also more or less works. Gravity starts out many, many orders of magnitude weaker than the other forces. The difference between <coughs> strong and electric forces was about a factor of 10. Gravity is not 10, not 10 times 10, not 10 times 10 times 10. It's 10 to the 40th power weaker than the other forces. So it's way outside the known universe. But if you follow the logic, the, it gets easier to put it on the slide. It was very challenging at first, but eventually gravity more or less unifies as well. So it's, you're getting out more than you put in. <coughs> now, that only works, I, ho I hope I, I wish 
shown the logic that works if you ha postulate this underlying symmetry between force and substance, which brings uh, a second level of unification beyond the unification of the symmetries of, this of the core theory. Now, that last thing suggested we should also be bringing gravity into the unification. In fact, it suggests that if we just look at the strength of interactions, we're already there, but it encourages us very much to think that we, we know what we need to know if we were smart enough to make that unification. <coughs> uh, however, uh, quantum gravity is uh, a very elusive subject. And there's a lot of talk about it, but absolutely no experimental data of any kind. Uh, sometimes people say that there's a crisis when you try to unify gravity with quantum mechanics. In some sense, I wish there were, but uh, astrophysicists do their daily work, no problem, with using general relativity and quantum mechanics at the same time. Uh, if you and and really, uh, if you. Uh, avoid questions about the extremely early universe and the interior of black holes. We have our core theory with Einstein's gravity fits, accommodates each other quite well, and there's no uh, difficulty. So what we would like, of course, is that a, a quantum theory of gravity actually says something. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Uh, is there a prospect for that? Well, there is a prospect, the, I think. The, the, uh, if we have supersymmetry, then we face the problem that, well, let me, let me say, put it positively. Then we have a lot of new particles. <laughs> we have the partners of all the force particles we know about, because I should have said no existing particles can be identified as partners in these transformations. And we have uh, all the new partners of the substance particles. And uh, we have an embarrassment that those don't have equal mass, so the symmetry has to be broken. Uh, that turns out to be challenging to do. And many of the ways that uh, have been proposed to do it involve gravity in an intimate way. At a technical level, uh, the masses of those particles may very well include information about what are called non-minimal couplings of the gravitational field. So they go beyond the most straightforward uh, uh, accommodation of general relativity with the core theory. And if we had access to those, we would have some real material for a quantum theory of gravity. <coughs> uh, another disconnected idea, but, uh, well, I'm throwing things out, <laughs> is uh, it's striking that the real numbers, which were devised as a model of, the, of how one measures length, and you divide, you divide, you divide, uh, and you have infinite decimals, if you like, that even though those operations now seem hopelessly naive, in the quantum world, you can't keep going <laughs> and, and measure ever finer distances as if you had a ruler. You have to do it in very indirect ways. Everything fluctuates. And the appearance of space and time is much more indirect than, uh, than in Newtonian physics. Nevertheless, at the foundations of physics so far, we still use the real numbers. I think that can't last. And fortunately, there's a, uh, well, there are many possibilities. We don't know really what, what's, what's, what's uh, out there, but one particular thing that I find very beautiful. It goes back to the early days of calculus and when people thought critically about this kind of what is length and what is measurement, is the idea of infinitesimals, things that are really, really, really small, smaller than the real numbers, but not zero. Uh, and it was only in the 20th century that a beautiful and consistent mathematical theory of infinitesimals was developed, and it's sitting there waiting for use in physics. That's why not. So <coughs> if, if nature doesn't use them, she should explain why. <laughs> right. uh, uh, coming back down to Earth, 
so to speak. Uh, one insight into uh, the nature of uh, space-time and its dynamics that we can certainly look forward to with confidence is the observation of gravity waves. That's imminent, I think. There are known sources that uh, will, will put out signals with sensitivities that a new generation of experiments will reach before long. These are things like neutron stars orbiting around each other and then spiraling in, or black hole neutron star pairs, things like that. Uh, and uh, we'll s have dramatic direct proof that space-time is dynamical and, and a new window into extreme astronomical conditions. There may be surprises there. Uh, a particular thing that almost seemed to have happened recently <laughs> is uh, events in the early universe are also moving around matter in violent ways. They also produce gravity waves. Uh, uh, you probably read in the news that there was this putative observation of gravity waves from the early universe, the, the, uh, as for, or not that directly, but their imprint on the microwave background radiation. Uh, uh, not this time, but one can do much more sensitive experiments and the, the, the jury is still out. <coughs> So those are more or less conventional hopes for unification. Now I'd like to uh, stick my neck out a bit more and talk about unifications where uh, it's more a, a desire and a hope than an actual proposal. Uh, or how should I say? Uh, it's more an itch, but I don't really know how to scratch it. You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, this one goes way back, like many things, to the ancient Greeks. Uh, Parmenides, in a complicated way, said basically that nothing ever changes. <laughs> and Heraclitus poetically said that change is everything. So there's a certain tension in these views. And that kind of tension percolated into uh, science and science and really was very dramatic in the, uh, at the dawn of the scientific revolution. Two of the great heroes, Kepler and Newton, were really <laughs> champions of those two views. Kepler constructed his model for uh, the different planets moving around on celestial spheres with circumscribed and inscribed uh, platonic solids. So this was kind of a static geometric perfection of the, of the, of the system. Uh, later, in the face of facts, I mean, one wonderful thing about Kepler is that he confronted his <laughs> ideas with the facts, and, and when they didn't work, uh, well, he still published the same <laughs> theories, but, uh, but he, uh, he honestly uh, spelled out what he found and undermined his youthful dreams. But in any case, it seemed for a long time that uh, Heraclitus was triumphant. In Newton's physics, uh, dynamics really is everything, and there's a clean separation between a problem of what are the basic equations on the one hand, those equations turn out to be dynamical, to tell you how things change, and the problem of what are the initial conditions on the other. And that's been very fruitful in the history of physics, has led us to success after success, but it somehow, to me at least, doesn't smell right. In the theory of relativity, uh, the separation between space and time is in play. You know, one has transformations that transform space into time. So the idea that you should t pick out one time and get things started there is very unnatural. It's very natural to think of space-time as a whole thing. And when you look down on space-time and look for its laws, uh, they shouldn't separate into first slice and then s dice. You, know, you should really should. So uh, that's a unification that I think is devoutly to be wished between uh, initial conditions and dynamical equations. That, I think, has to go. Mm. Oh, uh, Herman Weil, one of my great heroes, wrote eloquently on this subject 
and uh, I wanted one of the, the tragedies of my life is that I've never had a chance to collaborate with Her Herman Weil. <laughs> he, uh, I was much, you know, I was a baby when he died. But uh, I can do it posthumously. I turned one of his uh, paragraphs into a poem, and, and now, now I'm going to inflict it on you. He exposed the, uh, this tension between relativity and, uh, uh, and the separation of initial conditions in, in this profound way. He said, the world simply is. This is after a discussion of space-time as a natural framework of physics. In my consciousness, tethered to my mind and body, fleeting images come to life of the world, samples only. But the world simply is. It does not happen. <coughs> uh, now I'll talk about another unification that's devoutly to be wished the unification between information and action. This one actually, uh, I think, is uh, semi-ripe, as I'll describe. It's, I think we're tantalizingly close to getting this one, and I, a significant insight might get us there. So in its current formulation, of fundamental laws, physics relies heavily on the action. Action is what appears in path integrals as uh, in, in the measure, uh, exponentiated. Uh, action is what's invariant under the symmetries that control fundamental laws. Action is implicit in this Hamiltonian mechanics I mentioned before, which is foundational for quantum theory. Uh, a little joke at the end, but it's not entirely a joke, is that physics progresses by integration. Uh, in Newtonian physics, force was the primary concept, and you could have, in principle, semi-arbitrary forces, as Newton pointed out a few regularities, like his third law, but basically, uh, other than that, they were, in principle, unconstrained. Uh, in the 19th century, the concept of energy took over as a primary uh, building block of physics. One had the first law of thermodynamics that was postulated. And uh, energy is the integral of force. And not all forces can come from, uh, in from not all forces can be derived in a such a way that you have a conserved energy so that that constrained the possible laws. Hamilton's mechanics goes one step further. It, uh, implicitly or explicitly uh, promotes the action as something that when you integrate the energy, you get the action. And it also further constrains the possible form of laws. Another example that is uh, Faraday's law of electrodynamics. Uh, Faraday, when he uh, discovered the law of induction, probably thought he was making an experimental discovery that changing <laughs> magnetic fields produce electric fields. But nowadays, if you put it in the framework of Hamiltonian mechanics, you need potentials, and Faraday's law is just an identity. So it's a consistency check, if you like, on the possibility of formulating, of doing these integrations. Anyway, action is very fundamental. I don't know if one can go one step further and constrain actions. That would, but uh, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. Uh, but however, uh, let's suppose for the moment that action is the endpoint here. Uh, since Planck's constant, which has the physical dimensions of action, is a universal constant as far as we know, and for my money it looks very good, uh, that means that action, the physical quantity, is measured in, the, in universal units, a pure number. It's a numerical quantity. So. It's a numerical quantity that controls how the world works. We would like to have other ways of understanding it. Are there other numerical quantities that control how the world works that we might try to unify with action? Well, information is another thing that in, the, in modern times is becoming more and more a dominant way of thinking about the world. We think about it, in fact, in physical terms. We think about it as 
We talk about information density, information flows, and so forth. So can one unify action with information? Well, I think, as I said, I think we're ama amazingly close. The, uh, nowadays, many treatments, not of action but of entropy, start by talking about information and deriving the principles of statistical mechanics by ap applying information concept, information theoretic concepts to uh, mechanics. And uh, in that way, you learn that entropy you learn, by the way, that entropy is a measure of negative information, of ignorance. <coughs> now, there's a very strong formal connection between entropy and action that arises when you formulate uh, 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 thermal physics in terms of Euclidean, uh, in terms of Green's functions. It's very natural, it turns out, to formulate it in terms of uh, the behavior of Green's functions in imaginary time. And when you do that, you find out that the action goes over into the entropy. Now, so in a sense, we have links between information and action mediated through entropy. What's, I think, the only thing that what's missing is that the link between uh, entropy and action, although it's clear at a formal level, uh, is derived very indirectly. It's derived by uh, getting to the formalism of Boltzmann factors and futzing around, and you, and you prove it very indirectly. Not it w if, one, if one could understand that profoundly, I would say that we would have unified not only entropy and information, but also action and information. And that would be marvelous. <laughs> that would really bring, to g bring back the idea that the world in an even more profound sense than being calculable is calculable in terms of concepts that are related to calculation. <laughs> and uh, Blake, I think, feared that was the way the world works. And Maybe it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, quantum and symmetry. I will just formulate, just show you two equations that I hope you'll agree look very similar. <laughs> this is the basic equation of quantum theory, commutation relation between positions and momenta. This is a typical symmetry relation commutator of two symmetry generators, giving another symmetry generator. Uh, <laughs> they look a lot the same. <laughs> but at present, it's rarely discussed that uh, what the underlying group theory of, of quantum mechanics is. And basically, these two algebras, which look so tantalizingly similar, just live separate existences. They are – they exist as products, in fact, in different conceptual universes. That's another unification I would love to see and seems to be natural, though it may be a hundred years off. Uh, finally, no discussion of unifications would be complete without discussing the, uh, unif the physics of some very complex systems like neural nets of neurons <laughs> and uh, uh, Francis Crick advertises the astonishing hypothesis that mind emerges from matter. So far it looks very, very good, but we need additional concepts, sort of effective theories if you like, to elucidate and, and really prove that it works to understand mind or mapping between mind and matter at the molecular <coughs> level. So far, it looks good, I think. There's no barrier has been found to that program, but uh, it hasn't progressed nearly as far as our under molecular understanding of heredity and metabolism, for instance. <coughs> so, okay, so that now I'm going to uh, make predictions and uh, if anyone wants to bet, I'll 
happily bet, although we, uh, we may negotiate that the payoff time is 100 years from now, and I'll hold the bets in the meantime. <laughs> okay, so uh, a characteristic of these unifications is that when you unify these uh, of, quanti of, of, of the different parts of the core <laughs> theory is that you have transformations which not only change the strong colors into each other, but also the weak color charges into each other. You also, in the unified theories, of course, have transformations which change strong into weak charges. And those turn out to do things like changing quarks into electrons, when you work it out. And that leads to instability of protons. So uh, I feel very confident predicting that baryon will decay will be observed. It's a necessary consequence of these ideas and lead to a rich phenomenology. You can estimate, by the way, the rates, and the rates are on the edge of – well, they're, they're approachable. They, when they're uh, experimentally uh, accessible. In fact, it's a little embarrassing. It's probably they should have been seen by now. Okay, supersymmetry will be observed and lead to a rich phenomenology. That's what we need to culminate this equality of the interactions at short distances and also the aesthetic idea of unifying force and substance. I didn't mention the dark matter, but the dark matter – the nature of the dark matter will be revealed. The astronomers have found something out there. They don't know what it is. Uh, actually, there's a pretty good – hypothesis for what it is, which we'll, we'll see in much less than 100 years. Uh, and tangible consequences of quantum gravity will be identified and observed. Oh, sorry, this animation lost the joke that was there. Anyway, the dark matter will be axions. Uh, new kinds of numbers, including some form of infinitesimals, will be used to describe space-time. Gravity waves will be observed and become powerful tools in astrophysics and cosmology. And the fundamental laws will no longer separate into in initial conditions and dynamics. So these are my queries, but I didn't put question marks at the end. <laughs> and information will appear as a primary ingredient in physical law. And quantum mechanics will be formulated as a symmetry principle and integrated together with the other symmetry principles of physics. And finally, biological memory, cognitive processing, and emotion will be understood at the molecular level, uh, comparable to our understanding of metabolism and heredity. <coughs> okay, how long do I have left? Ten minutes. All right, that's plenty. So now <laughs> I'll talk about uh, – that's, that's the unifications, uh, near and speculative – well, speculative and more speculative, and then even more speculative. But, uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, the, the consequence, if you like, of the fact that uh, although there's a lot we don't know, there's also a lot we do know. Our core theory is really, really good. Uh, it's been tested under – with such accuracy and under such extreme conditions, I think that there's little doubt that it's adequate as a foundation for chemistry, uh, astrophysics, almost all of cosmology, all forms of engineering, and so forth. So the only limitation is using our brains to exploit this fantastic resource, this fantastic understanding that physics has won over what matter is and how it works uh, in the last 250 years. <coughs> oh, uh, famously, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and to which I add the uh, scolium that uh, nature's technology is very advanced <laughs> in quantum theory. <laughs> We have prospects for enhancing sensoria. I've actually been working on this. Uh, we're put to our sense of uh, color, our ability to resolve the electromagnetic spectrum, is put to shame by the mantis shrimp. 
we take three averages, the mantis shrimp, depending on the species, uh, has between a dozen and sixteen, extending into the infrared and also the ultraviolet, and also with sensitivity to polarization. So can we fight back? And I think the answer is clearly yes. With modern technology, we can put back information that's missing. Here I've done something that's easier to display on a computer screen, namely going from two color channels to three. This is a color blindness test. And uh, I don't know if there are any, any colorblind people in the audience. Can you t see the difference? No. <laughs> see, that crude model of colorblindness is you take R and G, the <coughs> red and green, and replace them both by their average. That turns this into this. And colorblind people have a very hard time distinguishing these two figures. And so we have those of us who are not colorblind can get some sense of what they're missing, and they don't see the number here. That's right thinking people see. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> but now, uh, if we open up a new channel by exploiting the possibility of modulating what they can see in time, we can open up a new channel and make things leap out. But I think it's lost in translation from, from Keynote to PowerPoint. So uh, I can show you privately afterwards. <laughs> it's really fantastic. but it's, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's totally lost in translation. OK, so let me make – so enhanced sensoria, I think there are many tricks that I've been – and that, that's coming. Uh, making things in the micro world, uh, since we know the laws, we can design new materials. In principle, physicists should put chemists out of business, doing things by pouring one substance into another and, you know, all that smelly stuff. Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> we should be able to calculate it all. <laughs> right? That has happened to a very large extent in aircraft design, for instance. Wind tunnels are no longer the state of the art. People compute, and it's much more flexible because you can – play with the designs much more easily and so forth. And some very strange things you, you may have noticed at airports with the wings pointing up and curling around in funny ways. That all comes from computing. Not Nobody thought – nobody dreamed that up uh, and tested it in a wind tunnel. So we should be able to do some things like that on a molecular level. And a great, great challenge, I think, for physics in the next hundred years is to develop the techniques to compute better in the quantum world. Uh, another aspect of that is that uh, uh, 30 years – more than 30 years later, people are finally learning how to compute with delicacy in QCD. Uh, very uh, – I'll just mention a landmark that, that was passed uh, a few months ago. Uh, it proved possible in a big computer calculation that doesn't compromise in any way, by the way. There's not – no perturbation theory, no Feynman graphs, none of that. It's the actual theory just discretized and, and uh, fed to a computer with controllable errors. Uh, people combining QED and QCD uh, succeeded in calculating the proton-neutron mass difference from first principles with decent accuracy. So that's a milestone achievement in itself since many aspects of how the world works depend on the precise value of that mass difference. But moreover, it's kind of a milestone that indicates that we can finally be serious about using fundamental physics to compute nuclear physics. So that should open the possibility of manipulating nuclei like atoms, perhaps leading to ultra-high energy lasers, new methods of energy storage. Well. Imagination is the limit, but we can open up the nuclear world with much more confidence. Not to mention figuring out much better how stars work and especially supernova explosions, which have been held up – and neutron stars have been held up by lack of control of nuclear physics. Making things on a somewhat larger scale and 
uh, that net I showed you, that mess that's inside our brain, is an example of a 3D fault tolerant self replicating, self repairing computer. The one that you put on your desk is not. So there's another opportunity for unification, if you like. Can we build uh, artificial computing machines that have these desirable properties? If we could, then uh, the dreams of people like uh, Olaf Stapleton of turning whole planets into gigantic computing machines, or let's say start with a mountain, move to an asteroid, then a moon, and then <laughs> into gigantic thinking entities uh, will become realistic. And, okay, it doesn't have to be just thinking. You could also imagine manipulating and self-replicating uh, uh, machines that will help to build each other and also the giant brain. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> building things <laughs> on a macro scale, and the grand master is <laughs> here, <laughs> here in the audience. Uh, whole planet brains I mentioned, but uh, gathering the energy that's available from a whole star to drive technical enterprises to make people's lives better, hopefully, not to fight, but, <laughs> but in any case, to capture that energy and put it to good use is a vision that uh, Stephen Dyson pioneered. I don't think that's going to happen in 100 years. <laughs> that <laughs> maybe in 250, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, the spirit, however, is now. Right? We're, uh, we need to capture the energy on the s of the sun on a much larger scale than has been done, and that's becoming an economic prospect. And so the road to uh, – so the spirit of this is already in nascent form beginning, and I think it, it'll inevitably grow. Although, you know, the, s the sun is pretty big, so it's going to take a long time <laughs> to surround it. But we can have uh, lots of fun intermedi at intermediate times and, and help the world with its uh, pollution and energy problems. <coughs> Uh, I'm running out of time, so maybe I'll have mercy and be still sure. Uh, we can expand the quantum sensorium also, and uh, I won't – well, just let me say that one as what a crucial aspect of quantum mechanics is that uh, you get interference, which is the most characteristic feature of quantum mechanics when you have different ways of reaching the same final state from the same initial state. Now, sometimes you'd like to interfere things that lead to different final states, but if you erase the evidence, which now with our exquisite control of atoms and detecting devices, in some cases you can, then you can restore the interesting interference. And so that's a way of accessing entanglement and delicate properties in the quantum world. That was all an excuse to make this joke. Right? Okay. Uh, this leads to uh, uh, the, the prospect of truly alien minds that would be able to uh, think about contradictory things, hold them in mind at the same time, make them interact with each other. Uh, it's <laughs> quantum computers is a new subject. Quantum AI is a subject that I don't think has been seriously addressed, but it requires an extraordinary imagination and maybe impossible for humans to imagine what an intelligence that really understood quantum mechanics would be like. You're supposed to laugh at that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So embracing contradictions, manipulating time, if you can – if you have an exact knowledge or exact storage of a state, you can revisit it. You can allow different times to interfere with each other. So this is truly alien intelligence and uh, fun, although daunting to think about. And then finally, let me uh, 
talk about our own uh, uh, more, more uh, immediate uh, questions of mind and how physics, as it develops, will impact uh, our notions of intelligence. This is already happening. Uh, we have distributed intelligence. We have sensoria, which are not only more sensitive, but also in different places. And with the notion of virtual reality, the notion of identity being tied to a body will erode. <laughs> And then finally, uh, I realize some of these notions are jarring, maybe potentially scary, these super intelligences that are so unhuman. But I take comfort from uh, history, <laughs> if you like, and the sort of what the greatest minds that we know about have been like. And they have a sort of creative humility and also a wisdom uh, that uh, let me briefly mention to, to uh, conclude. So this is a famous quotation of Newton. Uh, to myself, I seem only to have been like a boy and so forth and so on, while the, o the vast ocean of truth lay all undiscovered around me. This is sometimes thought to be uh, an expression of modesty or even a false modesty, but those are not Newton's characteristics. He was neither modest nor did he, <laughs> nor was he falsely modest. <laughs> he was just describing how he saw himself. I think it's really true. And, and if you think about the queries, you realize he imagined, he could imagine, because he was so profound and clever, he could imagine things way beyond what he had succeeded in understanding. He, although he achieved a lot, his, he also didn't achieve a lot <laughs> in, his, in his chemical experiment. He saw that there was a lot further to go. And so uh, getting insight <coughs> expands your horizons in such a way that you realize that what you've actually mastered is only a small part of what's possible. I've ex exemplified that in this talk as well. And then uh, finally, <laughs> uh, uh, complementarity I think is a bit of wisdom. I won't be able to expound on it very much, but it's the idea that there may be different ways of processing reality that are both informative and both valid in their own terms, but can't be applied at once. This is something that Niels Bohr extracted from quantum mechanics, and it's just a theorem in quantum mechanics. The primary reality is the wave function. But if you want to answer different kinds of questions, you have to process that reality in different ways that are mutually incompatible. I think it's much more general than that, that our ways of parsing reality, uh, we, can't handle, we, we can't handle reality. We have to uh, simplify it, parcel it, and uh, accept the possibility that issues like free will versus determinism. They're both valid ways of thinking about the world. We just can't do them both at once. In any case, uh, that leads me to another poem, which is this. Uh, now I collaborate with Walt Whitman. Uh, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. The world is large. It contains multitudes. If you're not bedazzled, you're not really looking. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh,